Hi, I'm Charles Malachy, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint, and today we're actually having the Hollywood Knowles Community Club Summer 2016 Garden Club meeting. Um, we're here at Brad and Sana's um, home, and we're going to have the pleasure of having Lisa Novick, director of the Theodore Payne Foundation with Netable, um, Net Native Edible Plants, who's going to be talking about butterfly and hummingbird native plants as well. We're also going to have Brad Ficus, who's the um, long, lifelong resident as well as plant expert and we're going to learn about how to grow giant vegetables having luscious and healthy fruit trees and um, and this is a beautiful example a beautiful garden which is a true Garden of Eden type backyard with all of the varieties of fruit trees that are um, planted cross-pollinating producing fruiting um, and let me give you the tour of all of those come and follow me So here we are with a variety of citrus trees that are actually planted as a hedge along the um, edge of the property. Um, the fruit trees range from mandarin oranges to navel oranges to lemons, limes, and, um, and grapefruits. There's a variety of citrus. You, if you're actually going to introduce a lot of citrus, try to keep the diversity in your garden. Do not plant just um, a row of Eureka lemons. Try to actually um, introduce a variety of citrus so they can cross-pollinate. It increases fruit yields for all of the individual trees, and that's a proven fact. Come and follow me, I'll show you some more. Take a look at this citrus tree over here. Um, this one here is the Bear's Lime, also known as the Persian Lime. It's the most popular of the store, um, the store limes that you can find in the, um, at your grocery store as well as the bars. This here is a Eureka lemon tree. We're, again, we're in the month of June, and take a look at how much fruit we've got here. Um, lemons, most citrus usually produce um, in the winter, starting November through um, early spring. But here we are in June, and this thing's still loaded with fruit. So behind me here are actually a row in a, in a group of um, avocado trees. There's one variety, a second variety, a third variety and a fourth variety at the further end of the garden. Again, there's four different varieties of avocados. You're looking usually for avocado plants to be a type A or a type B. They got fig trees, they got pomegranate trees, they got apple trees. Um, it just goes on and on and on. This is truly a garden of Eden. Almost everything here that gets watered actually produces food to feed the family. Um, and what better place to get your groceries than from your backyard? Good morning, everyone. Um, so you guys ready? We're going to start our summer 2016. Okay, I'll wait for you. Um, so summer 2016 Garden Club. This is now our 10th one since 2014. Um, and, <laughs> and what an amazing location. We're so privileged to be here at Brad and Sanaf, um, Ficus's. Um, residents and what an amazing paradise, a true Garden of Eden with tons of fruit trees um, of all the varieties um, all around us. So um, I'm hoping you take the time afterwards to enjoy walk the property. If you have any questions, um, Brad and I will be around afterwards as well. Um, we're also privileged to have two guest speakers with us that are very knowledgeable in plants. The first being Lisa Novick. She's the director of the outreach program at the Theodore Payne Foundation and she'll be talking um, about native edible plants, butterfly and hummingbird native plants, and so much more, and, and to answer any questions. So she's gonna be doing the first part of the program, and then afterwards, um, Brad will be discussing um, how to grow healthy and vigorous vegetables and fruits. Um, and he's also a plant expert and lifetime resident of the Hollywood Knolls, uh, and he'll be um, concluding. So um, Lisa will be going first. We're gonna take a little bit of break as we set up for Brad, and you'll help yourself to some more refreshments that'll be out here then. Um, and then Brad and I will conclude the program. And um, I'm gonna pass now the microphone to Lisa. So here we go. This is yours. So maybe, maybe I'll just clip it here or something. Oops. It's hard to do it all. Can you pull it out? I was gonna help, but I wasn't sure yeah. if I get to touch you. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> okay, so let's see. 
I'm trying. <laughs> okay, and, and then this will go like here if you want to pull okay. the shirt up. Just like, is that? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to begin by asking some questions of all of you to find out how much you know about California native plants. The, the mic's not working? No. You're not supposed to hear it. It's straight to him. Only I get to hear it. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Oh. All right. <laughs> okay. So um, let me just begin with this question. Just, and just throw out some answers. What percentage of the more than 6,000 California native plant species, subspecies, and varieties are, are the, the cacti? So what... Cacti. Oh. So, what do you think? Twenty percent, eighty percent, fifty percent. What do you What do you think? 18, 20, 20, 18, 30, yeah. seven. seven. What about this group? Say Thirty. Thirty. Okay, it's actually one to two percent. So, all those gardens you see going in that are drought tolerant gardens with hens and chickens and succulents and cacti are probably not native not native and if they're putting in lots of gravel they're increasing the heat island effect which then makes people use more air conditioning and increases climate change so there's a better way there is a much better way okay um let me ask you another question what percentage of residential um water use is landscaping approximately Give me like a ballpark fi figure. 30, 75? Okay, it's between 50 and 70 percent. For multiple family residences, multi-unit buildings, it's about 35 percent. So when you think of how we use our water in the suburbs and in the cities, landscaping matters. We are not only in a drought crisis, in a water crisis, we are in an extinction crisis. Um, since 1970, what percentage or what percent of vertebrate animals around the planet have been lost since 1970? Okay, 50%? 30. 30. Okay, it's about 52%, so you were pretty much right on. Now. There, I'll go back to a little story that was in my local newspaper uh, just last week. There was a young uh, girl, she's 12 years old, passionate about saving animals, passionate. She goes to um, Kenya, volunteers in a Kenya wildlife park as many times per year as her family can afford it. Does she plant native plants at home? and try to steward our biodiversity here? No, she's saving Kenya. It's so much easier to do what you can right here. And so that's what I'm here to talk to you about this morning, is that in California, we use one fifth of our energy to transport and treat water. And then the vast majority of that water is used on landscaping that does not support the ecosystem and does not support the food web. So you have to ask yourself, why are we doing this? If, if we're spending our water on plants that don't feed people and don't feed wildlife, what's the point? So what I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, is about native plants that support the food web and butterflies in, in particular and all sorts of other insects and animals that we need for their ecosystem services to benefit us. Okay, um, so perhaps all of you have seen this sign as you walked in. 90% of all leaf eating insect species worldwide can eat only native plants. So I have the picture of this California sister butterfly on here because its caterpillars can only eat the leaves of our native evergreen oaks. 
So if our native evergreen oaks disappear, that butterfly goes extinct. Now, usually, is that a tree or a this is a coast live oak. And there are, there are many um, evergreen oaks in, in California. There are smaller, this, this one gets about 50 by 50 feet. Um, and there are smaller ones. So there are, there are dwarf evergreen oaks. Um, so there's an oak to fit almost any space. Um, now I'm gonna stand and, well, okay. So why do you think caterpillars are, are important besides turning into butterflies and making these beautiful jewel-like creatures that are in our gardens, if we're lucky? Why are caterpillars important? They feed the birds. <laughs> exactly, they feed the birds. So butterflies are, are pollinators, not as efficient as, as bees and beetles and surfid flies, etc. But caterpillars are the main food of baby birds. It takes between 100 to 150 caterpillars to feed one little baby finch from the time it hatches until 17 days later when it leaves the nest. So if you plant native plants in your garden, you are going to make 35 times more caterpillars than non-native plants. So that means 35 times more baby bird food. And if you've read the uh, North American Bird Conservation website, you will see that in the United States, we've lost uh, between 60 to 90% of our bird populations in, in the last 50 years. I mean, this is so depressing. And I wouldn't be telling you this unless there was something we could do right here instead of just throw up our hands and say, woe is me and give up. We cannot give up. We have to do what we can right where we live with the space that we have in our yards. So for instance, if you plant lilac bushes, this um, feeds the caterpillars of a California tortoiseshell type of butterfly. So um, it makes beautiful blue flowers. Yeah, Ceanothus. Ceanothus. Yeah. So, there are, men, there are you know, dozens and dozens of species and cultivars of this plant, and they will all feed these kinds of butterflies, caterpillars. Um, if you plant buckwheat, you will feed the caterpillars of um, many types of blue butterflies. This is buckwheat, but, and there are like probably nine kinds that are regional. And the bees too, right? And, right. So anything, so this particular buckwheat is called a flat top buckwheat, and it gets about three feet by three feet. It looks like rosemary, but no, no scent. And it makes these pom-poms of white flowers that are about this big, all spring and summer. So at, at home, I have another type of buckwheat that's about three feet high and eight feet wide, and it's a dome of white pom-poms, covered with bees, covered with butterflies, yeah. As we go down that uh, steep hill to the lake, mm -hmm. and so the white pom pom, as you know, turns into a red crimson one in the fall, and it's dried. And you can actually take it and uh, put it in a baggie, and then maybe use your flour sifter. And there's all kind of recipes on the web, and you right. can make, you know, pancakes, pancakes, pancakes or muffins or something. Right. It's right in our backyard. Thank you. Um, and so when you do that, you're, you're making buckwheat flour. You, you don't even need to sift it because yes. the um, traditional buckwheat flour is a Russian kind of buckwheat. And it's the um, dried flower petals as well as the little microscopic uh, seeds. And, but what I encourage you to do is plant them in your yards because our wildlife are struggling, absolutely struggling in this drought, we're in the fifth year of the worst drought in the state's recorded history. And so our, our wildlife needs all the food that they can get. And um, just as a little side note, right now foraging is very popular. There are a lot of um, foragers that are holding classes in the National Forest and in Griffith <coughs> Park. And they're going out into our public lands and our wildlands and foraging um, white sage, foraging black sage, foraging um, 
currents from the golden current. All of this is depriving our wildlife of the food that they need to sur survive. What people should do instead is forage in your own garden. Forage in your own garden, not in what's left of the wild. And you can go to the Huffington Post and see a piece that I recently wrote on there um, with that exact title, Forage in the Garden, Not in What's Left of the Wild. So, um, so there are so many different kinds of, of edibles, but let me just stick with butterflies while I'm on that topic. Um, you know, when, when people make a butterfly garden, they're often just thinking of the nectar plant for the adult, and they completely forget about what do the caterpillars need? So I'll see all these glossy brochures that come from Armstrong's in La Cañada, where I live, and they don't have one caterpillar forage plant on this entire list of plants. And they will have in big headlines, make a beautiful summer butterfly garden. And I'm thinking, they have completely interrupted the entire cycle. There's not one caterpillar forage food on there. So whenever you plant, a garden. Think about what plants you could put in that would feed the caterpillars and then also make flowers for the adults. And the best way to do that, where did my book go? Okay, I think I need to get a book out of over here. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, this is essential reading for everybody. An Introduction to Southern California Butterflies by Fred Heath. This book tells you the caterpillar forage food for all of the 90 plus species in Southern California, as well as the nectar species, nectar plants for the adults. So for instance, um, if you wanted to say, support different kinds of blue butterflies, you'd look in here and you'd see that I'm finding it. And I just had one of these in my yard yesterday and it was beautiful. You'd plant buckwheat for the square spotted blue butterfly. And the females look different from the males. I had this butterfly yesterday on my buckwheat plant and the outside of the wings looked like that. But then on the inside, instead of blue, it was sort of a brownish black with orange at the bottom of the hind wing. And I thought, what is that? It was a female square spotted blue butterfly. So you can have so much fun just by planting the plants in your yard because the butterflies will find you. Um, how far do you think mother butterflies can smell the scent of the chemical signature of the leaf that they need to lay their eggs on? 20 feet, 100 yards, what do you, what do you think? I think it's in the miles. Okay, that's pretty good. All right. What do you think? It's seven to 10 miles. And it has to be that way because butterflies and like all other insects and animals around the world, they co-evolved with the plants of their place. So this butterfly needs to be able to smell the chemical signature of that buckwheat leaf because if she were to lay her eggs on say a lilac, that caterpillar would hatch out, start to eat the leaves, and it would not have the stomach enzymes to digest that particular mix of chemicals that's in the lilac leaf because its caterpillars have been eating the chemical mix in the buckwheat for millions of years and you just can't switch. It's like if, if suddenly we had no more usual people food and we were told, oh, go and eat tree bark, we wouldn't be able to do it. We'd, we'd you know, we would starve to death. We'd be eating, but we couldn't process the nutrients and we would starve to, to death. So this is why you need native. It's because of co-evolution. And 
you know, what, what I always like to remind people of when they think about gardening is that gardening has a lot of science in it. And when we think of landscaping, we need to remember that landscaping should be the use of nature's technology. Native plants are nature's technology. Those are the plants that have evolved in a particular region over tens of thousands to millions of years. So they're adapted to the soil. They're adapted to the rainfall. They're adapted or lack thereof. They're adapted to the climate and they're adapted to the insects and the animals of that place. So when you think of native plants worldwide, they're the latest best gadget that nature has evolved to deal with all the different stresses of that place. And so for instance, when you plant native plants, you're not only using one seventh the water of most non-natives, but you don't need soil amendments, you don't need fertilizers, and you most importantly do not need pesticides mm -hmm. because the plants co-evolved with the insects and animals. And for the insects, um, they've achieved this happy kind of balance. So sages, for instance, are eaten by very few leaf-eating insects because they have these incredibly wonderfully scented aromatic oils, it's in the mint family, um, that is just too strong for most leaf-eating insects to eat. So, so you rarely see any kind of a little hole on any of the sage leaves. When you do see holes on the non-aromatic California native plants, there's usually only a hole in one in 10 leaves. I can live with that because we should celebrate holes. If we have holes in our leaves, it means that we have life in our garden. We have insects that are then gonna feed the birds and feed the lizards. And just as an illustration, How many of you know what this lizard is? What kind of lizard this is? I can't see. It's reflecting back. How's that? It's not a gecko. No, it's a, it's a lizard. It's a blue-bellied oh, blue lizard. Oh, I see it now. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not yeah, I know. oh, look, it's a it's no, he's, Isn't he gorgeous? insurance <laughs> Okay, so this is the western fence lizard. We need to keep this guy well fed with insects through our native plants because this lizard has an enzyme in his blood that kills Lyme disease. So Ticks carry Lyme disease. Baby western fence lizards are one of the main incubators of baby ticks. And so when the baby ticks are born, they latch on to the lizard, they suck the lizard's blood, and as the lizard's blood circulates through the tick, it kills the Lyme disease in the tick. And then the tick falls off, and then you're hiking by, the tick gloms onto you and sucks your blood, but you don't get Lyme disease because this lizard has cleaned it out of the tick. So we're really lucky. We have this lizard west of the Rocky Mountains. In the Midwest and the East Coast, they do not have this lizard. When you get bitten by a tick on the East Coast, you have a greater than 90% chance of getting Lyme disease. If you're bitten by a tick on the west coast, it's about less than 10. So we need to help these guys because they help us. So, um, so let's, let's just go back to co-evolution for, for a minute. So when we think of native plants and nature's being nature's latest best gadgets, it's technology. Um, when we do that in our garden, we are helping perpetuate the nature of our place. Because when you think of all the places around the world that are iconic for their nature, like the Amazon, with its, its jacaranda trees and all the other sorts of plants, those jacaranda trees in the Amazon feed 
Amazonian insects and animals. Here, the jacaranda blossoms only feed um, bees with their pollen. But other than that, they're just sucking up water and, feed, and completely, um, the 90% of leaf eating insects that need natives are completely missing out. And then all that protein that would go into the food web to feed the food web is lost. So that's why we need native. And that's why I'm hoping that what you'll do when you um, go home to this afternoon and you start to research more about native plants, um, what I'd like you to do is look at our website, which is front, which is, is the 2016.nativeplantgardentour.org. Uh, and in it, there were 41 native plant home gardens. And on the tour, they were organized into west side homes and valley homes, San Gabriel and San Fernando. And then there was a, there's a legend with plants for dry shade, um, Con conventional edible plants, if you have clay, um, the uh, plants at that home with clay are all clay adapted. So there's this whole variety of things that you can look at, or like the mountain means it has plants that do slope retention. So start researching by going on to the 2016.nativeplantgardentour.org. You'll see photos and plant lists of beautiful native plant gardens that would fit into any residential setting and have your neighbors still love you. I'm not talking about succulents and cactus or plants that all go drought dormant in, in the summer. I'm talking about evergreen flowering plants that give you color and, and greenery year round. Yeah. So do they require a lot of water, which we don't have? No, because they've, if, okay, so here's another website. Go to garden forward slash garden um, website, which is maintained by the city of Santa Monica. California native plants um, use 83% less water than non-natives. And that's because, like any native plant around the world, they've evolved to survive on rainfall. <laughs> there was no one out there watering them in the dry season. We're a desert. Well, we're not a desert. We're semi-arid. Deserts on the other side of the San Gabriel Mountains. This is semi-arid. So if you look at Southern California and the, um, not on the coastal side of the mountains, from Los Angeles down to San Diego, we have approximately 3,000 native plant species. And very few of those species are cacti, and like about three. And all the rest are lilac, sage, redbud, um, oak, buckwheat, the, um, the Indian mallow, manzanita, toyon. I mean, there's 3,000 plants to choose from, not desert plants. And they, um, So, um, so native plants are, have evolved to survive on rainfall. So California native plants um, can make it through, you know, years and years and years of drought. I mean, they're really stressed in, in the wild, but they can make it. If, if you took the other non, most of the other non-native plants, you know, that all the con conventional nurseries sell, they would be toast without artificial irrigation. And so, um, so when you plant natives, what you do to establish them is you give them a deep watering of three to five gallons, it depends on your soil type, once a week approximately, every seven to 10 days for the first year, including the first two summers. And what you're doing is you're mimicking an El Nino year. You know, when, when the rains come down, the ground is nice and soaked and the plant roots can follow the moisture down. Then during the second year, you would elongate the dry periods between the deep watering. So for instance, in my yard, 
in La Cunada, I've got decomposed granite soil. It drains like a bathtub. I mean, you pour the water in a one cubic foot hole and it's gone in like three minutes. So I watered once a week for the first year. And then the second year, I watered once every two weeks. And that's if it wasn't raining. And then by the third year, the plants were completely established and they survived strictly on rainwater in the winter. And in the dry season, watering only once every three to four weeks. So um, this is my backyard. With my conventional edible garden in the rocks right there. And then this is my patio with the redbud tree, my no mow bunch grass lawn, beautiful green lawn. You don't have to mow it, it's drought tolerant. It's virtually all not, not native. Yeah. Yeah. What was your lawn again? It's cr called Creeping Red Fescue. It's good for um, partial sh um, shade to shade. And it's a bunch grass, so it's a very soft kind of um, meadow mounding grass. It gets about a foot tall, but flops over. Um, it's really nice to walk on in bare feet. So um, anyway, so that's, so that's just to show you the kind of garden that you can have with native plants. On, on my little street, um, when I, I did my backyard first and then I went and moved into the front yard to get rid of the roses and the lawn and the invasive non-native ash tree. And I went around and talked to my neighbors first about what I was going to do. And because it's La Cunada, you know, they were all like, eh, you know, what, what is she going to do? She's going to put in cactuses it's gonna look horrible and bring down our property values, blah, blah, blah. And so what instead happened is that now four of the eight houses either have a near total native garden or at least 30 to 40 percent natives in, in their front yard in, in just three and a half years because they've seen that you don't have to sacrifice beauty and then you bring in the birds, you bring in the insects, you bring in all of this life that absolutely cannot survive without the native plants. Okay, um, any questions before I move on? Yeah. Where can you find these plants? Because I've had so many times. At the Theodore Payne Foundation, which is about 20 minutes from here. There is a map on the back. What, what you would do is just um, go up Cahuanga and then get on Glen Oaks, and we're in Sun Valley. At, near the mouth of La Tuna Canyon Road, right near near Sunland. So what, what if we ask nurseries to start bringing in more? Nurseries? I would love it if you would do that yeah, because because um, the the more that people come into their nursery and start saying, please carry natives. We don't want to have to drive 12 miles to the Theodore Payne Foundation. That that would be great because you know as much as I'd love to say to you, yes, get all your plants from us. I want all of Southern California to have these plants. These should be everywhere because this is everyone's natural inheritance as much as Yosemite and Joshua Tree and, and the Redwoods. The you know, plants of where we live are our natural inheritance and that's what our nurseries should be carrying. In Australia, they actually do. Um, an, another one of my Huffington Post pieces was about um, when I was visiting my relatives in Australia, I'm driving along through Melbourne and I'm looking at the residential landscapes and I'm seeing lots and lots of native plants in the residential landscapes. Now, the Australians, when they all colonized, Aus Aust the white Europeans, when they colonized Australia, you know, they brought in the begonias and the, all the, you know, non-native plants because that was, you know, the symbol of empire. But then in the 1980s, the Australians had the beginning of, you know, their 30 year drought. And the government said, you know, we've got to start helping farmers because they're planting the non-native plants that are actually salinating the soil and taking up the water more so than our native gum trees. So the government started working with the farmers in Australia to plant more native plants. 
the program was so successful, it was called Land Care, that they then started to reach out to conventional nurseries. So now, if you go to Australia into any of their big box stores or little mom and pop nurseries, you will find hundreds of species of Australian native plants, many of them strictly local types. And I'd love it particularly if you would beat up on Lowe's. Because Lowe's in Australia is the 50% owner of Masters. They're one of their biggest uh, big box, you know, hard hardware um, center landscaping chains. They're throughout Australia. They carry hundreds of species of Australian native plants in Australia. Can you find one California native plant at Lowe's in California or anywhere across the US? No, everything they carry is non-native, everything. So please contact Lowe's, contact Armstrong's, contact all these places and say, please, we want our native plants. We are in a drought crisis and we are in an extinction crisis. Just to you know, say it again, we are in a sixth mass extinction. The five previous extinctions were caused by natural events like volcanoes spewing out so much stuff it increased uh, the atmospheric load and then the, the planet heated up and then things died. Or giant asteroids hitting. The reason we're in the extinction crisis now is because of loss of habitat. So we're never going to get grizzly bears back here near the Hollywood Bowl. We, we aren't. But we can save the butterflies. We can save the birds. We can save the lizards that keep us healthy. We can save all kinds of migrating birds that are berry eaters. Like, um, for instance, if you plant toyon, that's a toyon, very mature one. This is what Hollywood is named for. Those white flowers become clusters of red berries. And guess what? Another miracle of co-evolution. They bury right at cedar waxwing migration time around Valentine's Day. So when the waxwings are migrating from Central and South America up toward the Arctic, coming through here when the toyon is full of berries, and because these are berry-eating birds, that's what they need. And they will find you. And just like the mother butterflies will find you to lay their eggs, because they absolutely cannot live without those plants. So yes, we're in a sixth mass ex extinction, but everybody can do something about it where they live, in a container, in a small plot of land. You can do something positive to help turn the ship. And this is what everyone needs to do. Just do something, just plant one, and we'll be better off. And then the other thing, the other benefit, besides helping insects and animals, is you also help yourself if you have a conventional edible garden. UC Davis researchers uh, did a study where they wanted to check how much, how effective native pollinators were. And um, so what they did was they approached um, agriculturalists in the Central Valley uh, with insect pollinated crops like almond orchards and other insect pollinated crops. And they said, um, we will pay you to take out 5% of your crops and plant hedgerows of native plants around your insect pollinated crops. And at first the farmers did not want to do this. They said, we're going to lose in income. We're losing 5% of our plants. We are going to lose income. So the researchers said, we will pay you for whatever drop in income you might have. If you will just please participate in this experiment. So they did. And at the end of the experiment, they found that they had 19% more yield with 5% fewer plants. And that was because when you have the native plants around your conventional edibles, your tomatoes, your red peppers, whatever, you have pollinators of all different sizes and shapes 
that will give you a more complete extraction of the pollen grains. So imagine if you have the same shape of insect with fuzz on the same part of its body going in and out of a flower, you're only going to hit the same spots. But if you have, say, a male valley, valley carpenter bee with fuzz all over its body, and he's big, he's got green eyes too, he's very handsome. <laughs> um, that that um, male valley carpenter bee is going to take out pollen um, in a diff from different parts of the flower than, say, this other native bee. Now, I'm not sure what this one is, but this is much smaller. And it's sort of long and skinny, whereas the valley carpenter male is big and fat. So the point is, when you plant the natives, you get um, so many different varieties of pollinators that are up to 250 times more efficient for the native bees than the honeybees. Um, typically, you know, when people think of saving the bees, they're only focused on honeybees. But we need to help our native bees. And the, the native bees um, are terrific because even though they don't make honey and they don't make hives, they are resistant to the varroa mite that's killing the honeybees because our native bees co-evolved with that mite, so it doesn't hurt them. Our native bees do not um, mate with the Africanized bees, so they're always going to stay friendly and shy because they're solitary bees. They sleep alone in flowers at, at night. I mean, they're darling little things, or they, or they cling to a leaf with their, with their mouth parts. I mean, they're sweet little bees. And so if, if you look at um, the native bees, they can get so much more done in an area in so much less time, because the native bees will go farther into an area and not get stopped by tall stuff because they evolved going over and through stuff. Whereas European honeybees typically evolved with crop rows and they tend to stay on, on a row. And so, so plant native. You help the native bees, you help the native butterflies. Um, and then by creating all those caterpillars, you feed the baby birds, and then you get natural pest control on your conventional edibles from the birds that you're inviting into your garden from the caterpillar forage food plants that you've planted. It all works together. In, in my backyard, I have never had to spray or use any kind of pesticide treatment ever. It's a completely happily existing ecosystem that is self-sustaining and takes care of itself. So this is what, what we're all trying to achieve, right, as, as gardeners. We're trying to achieve a place that is not only beautiful as aesthetically, but it's a place that's full of life. All green is not the same. Native green, wherever you are in the world, is the best because that is what keeps the ecosystem alive. So um, I'll stop talking and open the floor to questions. Yeah. Um, we've had a tremendous influx of snails, uh -huh. which we've had before, but an awful lot this year. Right. Do they serve a purpose? And we've been putting snail bait out, which is not really Right. Well, snails typically like the non-native plants because okay. they're more, more tender. If I mean, I've never. Are they good or bad? Well, I mean. I think for the birds that can peck through the snail shell and eat the snails, that's, that's good. But um, in, in my yard, ever since I got rid of the non-natives, um, I, I don't have a snail problem. Just as a point of interest, at one of our meetings, Charles gave us all the plants with butterfly legs. I planted three no, clusters no, no. as a milking no, company. Yeah. My place looks like a, a, a butterfly jungle up there. I've never seen so many butterflies in my life. It, it right. works. Right. Absolutely. Right. Works. And I never had them before, but they're all over the place. Right. Well, and that's that's because of the um, co-evolution aspect. 
Yeah. So I'm gonna add. And if you can repeat their questions, it'll help. Oh, okay. The video. Uh, but my question to build on John is, um, the plants that I gave away, and I've been giving away for now two years, and I was gonna bring another 30 today, but I knew you were coming and I was hesitant because I know you're probably gonna trump this idea. But I was giving away milkweed, some uh -huh. that were native, but the ones that were performing the best now that I see in the community are the tropical milkweeds. Um, and are we, allowed, are we allowed to keep the tropical milkweeds in our garden or should we be cutting it down at the end of the year? Is there yes. something we can do to keep it? Or, it or should we be uprooting them now and just doing native? Um, okay, if, if they're caterpillars, okay, so the question was, what about tropical milkweed and should we be uprooting it and, you know, just getting rid of them now? If they have caterpillars on them now, leave them because they're feeding the caterpillars and we need more monarchs. But what you want to do is phase out that tropical milkweed and phase in the natives. And you can do that by in the fall mimicking what would happen with the native milkweed, which is that it goes dormant in the winter and then pops back up in the spring. Now here's why. Um, I know people have planted tropical milkweed with the best of intentions because they're worried about the monarchs. And we should be worried about all butterflies because all butterflies are in trouble in our part of the state, for the most part. There are a couple of species that are okay, but for the most part, the vast majority of them need our help. So with the monarchs, the reason why you do not want to plant tropical milkweed, even though it's evergreen and it makes an orange flower instead of a white flower, is because when that plant stays evergreen, it is a year-round host for the OE spores. It's an OE parasite called um, Ophoro, Ophorocystis electrosera. It's easier to say OE. Okay, so there's this OE parasite that um, lives inside the, the monarchs and the queen butterflies larva. It's, it's caterpillars. And then um, it, makes, it makes more of itself, more and more spores inside the caterpillar. And then um, when the caterpillar goes into its, its chrysalis and then hatches out, there are all these OE spores all over the wings, the body. And most of the time the um, butterfly is um, malformed. It can't fly. It can't even get out of the chrysalis some, sometimes. And, but what happens is when the monarch is born and it's just covered, covered with these little spores, it coats the milkweed plant. And then when other monarchs land on that plant to lay their eggs, then when the caterpillar hatches out of the shell and eats the shell and eats the leaf, then it's ingesting the tiny, tiny spores in, into its body and then the whole thing starts all over again. So when you have the native milkweed that dies back in the winter, you're taking away that vector for the OE to con continue and just continually reinfect the monarchs. So, so what they're finding, and I sent Brad three um, links from uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and then two other links that say do not plant tropical milkweed and phase it out and put in native. And, um, and what they're finding too is that in Texas where all these people in Texas have planted you know, vast areas of tropical milkweed, the monarchs on their way down to Mexico to the forests there to winter over, I mean to overwinter, are picking up the OE spores and bringing it down into Mexico and just devastating the populations in, in Mexico. Whereas if the people in Texas were planting the non-native milkweed, I mean we're planting the native milkweed that would die back, the monarchs would keep on going and then only the healthy ones would survive to fly all that way from the Northeast and the Midwest down into Mexico. And then you get a population in, in Mexico that's not infected. But now we're infecting the Mexican population because of all of our non-native milkweed.
but you say if there's if there's a caterpillar on the even the tropical milkweed, don't just leave it. Be just leave it. Un okay. un unless you can you know, find a source of the native milkweed somewhere. It's pretty hard to find now because everybody's panicked and everybody's, you know, buying it. But what I would suggest in, instead to do is, is leave it on there. And then in the fall, when the native milkweed would just, you know, turn brown and die back, then um, chop back your tropical milkweed and get busy growing from seed. Seed is the most um, cost-effective way to grow the, the native milkweed. And there are many different kinds. There's narrow leaf, there's um, desert milkweed, showy milkweed. There are all these different kinds that, that, that you can do with different leaf types that will all support the monarch and grow dormant in, in the winter. Yeah. So the tropical milkweed is an orange flower, kind of like a lantana in a way. Right. Right. It's, if it's bright orange, you, it's, it's the wrong kind of milkweed. And I've actually had discussions with people at Armstrong's um, when I've been at events and the Armstrong's people say, oh, but people like the orange flowers. We want to give people what they want. And I say, people want to help the monarchs. And this is not helping. This is not helping. And so, you know, if you are happen to be in an Armstrong and you see them carrying the tropical milkweed, educate them. <laughs> because what happens is when I talk to them, they look at me and they say, oh, she just wants to sell more of her product. Well, we just want to sell more of our product. It's like, no, no, that's not what I'm, why I'm doing this. I want for my kids and my grandkids, I want a Southern California with as many butterflies in it as when I was growing up here. There were way more butterflies when I was a kid here. I want a Southern California with all the birds and the insects and the animals that make it this place. And you need the natives in order to do that. Yeah. Okay. Does it die down every year you have to replant? No, it just dies back above ground, but the roots stay alive, and then the winter rains feed it, and then up it pops in around March. Yeah. yeah. How easy is it to propagate the, the uh, native uh, milkweed? Very easy, because. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as widespread as it used to be until we came in and erased it all <laughs> if, if it didn't self so easily. Okay, so if I see, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, oh, yes. I have a question. This is my milkweed that I have, and I got this one insect on it, and I, you mm -hmm. know, that's what happened to oh, my... Um, I, I oh, that's a wonderful beetle. Is that that's yes. That's, okay, so what that, that she was so she just showed a beautiful black and red beetle on the milkweed, and so what happens when you plant milkweed is then you invite the golden aphids in, and we and so you never need to spray for the golden aphids because then the beetles that you have on your phone there the beetles come in and eat the aphids and then the birds come in and eat the beetles and you've just got this wonderful complete food chain going. Yeah, I don't so. Spray at all. That's, that's great, yeah. So, so what I hope you'll all do is use the summer to educate yourself. Go to the 2016 Native Plant Garden Tour website. Look at the pictures, look at the plant lists. Um, use the sheets that are in your information packet. Read these carefully. And then the three things you need to know to get started with natives are the type of soil you have, slow or fast draining, the type of sunlight your space gets, and, this, and the size. And with those three pieces of information, then you can plan your, your yard. So for instance, if you, um, like let's say you knew that you wanted to create an informal hedge along a, a fence line that was 36 feet long you would look at this lilac and say, oh, that gets six feet wide. So I'm going to plant six of those in the 36 foot long space because six times six is 36. So that's, that's how you do it. You plant for width at maturity. <coughs> so size, soil, and sunlight, and then width at maturity and plant in the fall and winter. That's the optimal time. You can plant around, but 
it's just so much easier when the heat's over and the rain is starting. So use now to figure it out. Then in October, we have our blowout plant sale. And, um, and then plant is, you know, late October, early November. And you'll get all these wonderful creatures. Yeah. One last question. You're talking about pesticides, and I just wanted to share it with the group. I think I know the answer, but I'll have you say it. Um, neem oil is considered organic pesticide, and spinosad is another product that's considered organic pesticide. Would you recommend spraying those products on your native plants? Yeah, but you'll never need to. I mean, rare, okay, not never. I should say not say never. You will rarely, if ever, need to spray a native plant because they've because they've co-evolved with all the stuff that's out there, scale and you name it, they know how to cope with it. It's, it's the non-native plants that are like being plopped into this environment with all of these different insects and animals and parasites that are like, oh my God, where are we? What do we, how do we cope with this? So, so really, the, what I want to say in, in closing is the way that we have made ourselves garden is so difficult because the way that we currently practice gardening is to truck in water from 400 miles away to completely change our soil then spray all these pesticides and herbicides I mean we've made it so much more harder than it needs to be because we're planting plants that did not evolve here and can't survive without all these artificial life support measures. And then those plants aren't feeding the ecosystem. So, so if, if you can help it, don't, because your chances are you're gonna kill the 99 beneficial stuff in addition to the one thing that you think you do wanna get rid of. Yeah. I'm wondering, we have vegetable gardens. Does uh -huh. that play a role here? Yeah, because I think I mean, think what's important to remember is that we should use our water on plants that feed people or plant, plants that feed wildlife. And if it's just sitting there being green but not doing anything, why are we spending water on it? Well, if, right, if we're eating it, great. If so, perfect. I mean, that's, that's why, for instance, I have, you know, this section of my backyard in the rocks that hold down the gopher wire why that's conventional edibles and then everything else around there is all native so, so the, the edibles don't native and every it doesn't make any difference with that it's just whatever you grow yeah just grow so just sort of do the litmus test does it feed people or does it feed wildlife and if it does you're good to go good. yeah yeah um so you're talking about how some of these plants have a chemical scent that the butterflies Mm -hmm. smell. Mm -hmm. So if you plant some native plants that have that good scent and then some non-native plants that might have a different scent, mm -hmm. does it interact with the, with the good scent and keep the butterflies away or can they still smell the, the one that's good? Great question. So the question was, um, if you plant native plants in with the non-native plants, can the butterflies still smell the, leaf, the chemical signature of the natives? Yes, they can if you clump, like, clump several of a kind together. So for instance, if you had an entire yard of Mediterranean rock rose, which is, you know, drought tolerant but not native, and then you only had like, you know, one lilac, it might be hard for the butterfly to smell that. So I would do, you know, four or five lilacs in an area to, you know, in, to get that scent going. And so it's, it's easier for butterflies to smell what they need if, if you have, um, sort of arcs or, or, or drifts like you'd find in nature of a certain species. Because then it'll come on the wind, they'll find it with their antenna and come to you. Yeah. Does the Paint Foundation refer to any gardeners who work with the Paint Foundation? Great question. Okay, does the, paint, does the Theodore Paint Foundation work with any landscapers? Um, we do a Landscaping for Resilience program, which is a public project program to, to train people in native plants in public spaces, um, and that's community driven. But for your own private yard, uh, you should email info at theodorepain.org or lisa at theodorepain.org and we can send you a list of landscapers that um, can come out, do a site assessment, make a plan, or put the whole thing in, just whatever you, you want to do. Thank you. Great question. 
Okay, let me just quiz you. Uh, what percentage of California's energy is on transporting and treating water? 40. What? Okay, out of 100%, what of California's, California's water energy water is used to transport and, and treat water. 20. So 20% 20 of the energy is to transport and treat water. Um, what percent of California's water use is in the cities and, and the suburbs? About, about 80 percent. Um, what percentage of um, water do people spend on their landscaping typically? 50 to 70. 50 to 70, okay. And um, what percentage of insects can only eat? <laughs> 90% of leaf-eating insect species can only eat native plants. Okay, so... Um, is there any competition with, uh, with plants that are not native? The insects, do they bring insects in? Well, okay, so the question was, will the insects, will the plants that are not native bring insects in? The plants that are not native, the bees can still get pollen from the flowers, but they've done studies and they've shown that if you have native flowers right here like a clump of them and then the non-native flowers because the bees have co-evolved to recognize certain plants as food they will automatically go to the native plant but the non-native plants what those the non-native flowers can still in theory feed the pollinating the the, the, the nectar eaters but but the leaf eaters, the non-native plants, are, are only going to feed that 10% of leaf-eating insect species that are the generalists and can eat both native and non-native. But if, but if you gave, if you took an insect that can eat both native and non-native and you showed it a native plant and a non-native plant, it would automatically go toward the native because that's what it co-evolved with. What I really meant to ask was, plants that are not native, uh -huh. do they have insects that with them that stays here and evolve? Um, yes. With the native well, yes. So what happened is um, right now we're facing this devastating um, oak die-off from the polyphagous shot hole borer. This is a Vietnamese beetle that came in, um, you know, with plants on some shipment or and what it does is it has killed half the oaks in San Diego County and it's in LA County and it's killing our oaks too and it's and they think it's going to take out 90 percent of, of the avocado trees. Avocado. Yes, so the Forest Service is putting out signs saying imagine a world without guacamole because they want to get people <laughs> you know ex thinking about this. So so the question about evolution is you know Okay, there's this writer called Emma Morris, and she irritates me more than I can say. She wrote a book called Rambunctious Nature, and in it, she sets up this argument where she's saying, we've wiped out nearly all wild places on the planet. There's really very few places anymore that be, can be con considered wild. True, we have. Only 4% of wildlands, for instance, in the United States are still wild. 55% is urban and suburban, 41% is agriculture. So true. Then she says, toward the end of her book, so we should just let nature take care of it. You know, we should, you know, we, we're increasing plant, plant diversity by having all these non-native plants. And what she completely failed to do her research on when she wrote this book was that, well, what about those 90% of insects that can only eat native? So it's like with the monarch butterflies. We're down to 1% to 2% of many of the populations. We could wait for the monarch butterflies to throw a gene in some in individual that would be able to eat something other than milkweed, but the chances of that happening are very rare. And in the meantime, the monarchs would probably go extinct. So what we as people need to do is, is pay attention to those evolutionary relationships and support them. And so in the meantime, with all of these uh, you know, non-native insects and animals coming in, 
Many of the non-native animals are killing off the natives, like the Argentinian ants are completely wiping out the, har the native harvester ants that keep our, um, that uh, horn, horn toad, the California horn toad, it's like a, a lizard, alive. And um, the Argentinian ants are just wiping out native plant species up and down the entire state because they farm the ants which farm, I mean, they farm the aphids that carry a fungus that kill the natives. And so it's just causing devastation. So, I, yeah, so to take a really long view, probably in about 10 to 20 million years from now, <laughs> we might evolve non-native species that can then use our native species. But in the meantime, we're gonna have massive dieback and we're already having that. And the thing is, is that we're not gonna have the speciation that we had. We're, we're never gonna get back up to the diversity of species that we have. Because when you think of it, 200 million years ago when Earth was pan, all pan, Pangea, and there, there were many less plant, insect, and animal species then. Um, Everything was all linked, and they, and then when continental drift happened, and all the continents split apart, and you had ones being affect, affected by different currents and rainfall, and then they lived apart for 200 million years. That's why you got this incredible array of plant, insect, and animal uniqueness in parts of the world. Like one third of all of California's native plants occur nowhere else on the planet. And so if we wipe those out, chances are they're not going to ev evolve again because the plant stock just isn't there to, to you know, make them happen again. The habitat is here. Right. Yeah. yeah, so. We've had a tremendous change in the cost of our water as of April, mm -hmm. DWP. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to do native and drought tolerant at the same time? Yes. So what you want to do is um, when you plant, say, like, let's say you have uh, French lavender, Mediterranean rock rose, whatever else. You can stick in um, sages, buckwheats, any of the native plants that have similar sunlight and water needs with those non-native plants. How do you find out what's drought tolerant? Will your organization have a list maybe? Or um, okay, so at our nursery, we have the nursery separated into six sections. Oh. One of them is the riparian section, the plants that evolved along a stream. Just don't go into that section. And then everything else will be drought, drought tolerant. The penstemons you might need to water like once every two to three weeks instead of being drought tolerant, but still, that's pretty darn good. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of the native plants, that, let's say the, the, the wild land like, uh -huh. um, it, it, a lot of it grows as more native to some areas that are a little bit north of here. Mm -hmm. And when you say native, how much variation is there in what exactly is native? Like the city of Los Angeles in this area hates the Wachitonia palm, which I believe is native to to, to the desert, right? And 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 they they sprout everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. They're menaces. Yeah. Yes. Well, but. Are they a good plant or a bad plant? Well, they're great in the desert, but I mean, in an urban setting, they're invasive. They have little seeds like ball bearings that people can slip on on, on, on sidewalks. I mean, I, I don't... They're between... I would not... Yeah. Okay. The issue really is, is there, there's all these little ecosystems there. Right. Because Southern California is as diverse as mountains, deserts, right. coastal areas, or desert areas, you know. Okay, so to your, the man's question was, you know, if it's native, how, how do we know it's native to here and will do particularly well here? So on our signs, every single one of our plants at the foundation has a sign like this that tells you height and width, flower color, whether it's evergreen, when it blooms, the soil preference. And then it also on there has, um, for instance, this is white sage and it says nat natural habitat dry slopes in coastal sage scrub, chaparral, which is this, uh, yellow pine and yellow pine forest less than 5,000 feet at, at elevation. So you can look in 
in the natural habitat section of all of these signs, and all this information is also on our website uh, un under uh, the Native Plant Library. The uses of white sage. Okay, um, so white sage you can um, use it in cooking. It's um, great as for tea. It's um, good on roast. It's good on roast potatoes. Um, you can make infusions of it with elderberry flowers and manzanita berries uh, with the leaves. Yep. Yeah, so all kinds of uses. And I think it's used for, the Indians use it for purification. A lot of people believe that to chase bad things out of their house, right. they, they put it into a wick uh, stick and they, they burn right. it. Right. So this is one of the plants that is being foraged into extirpation in our local mountains by the foragers. Plant it at home. Um, then the golden currants over here, um, these, this plant goes drought dormant in the summer. So plant it behind an evergreen foundational plant like a, a manzanita or something. It'll blossom in the spring with these yellow flowers that hummingbirds love and then when they're pollinated, berries for people and birds. So there's... down here. Pardon me? Um, Okay, this is an interesting plant. That doesn't really make people food, but that actually can be pruned like boxwood. That's an island bush snapdragon. That's a great dry shade plant. So, I like that one. Lisa, we're getting, getting really close to time. Close I know. End. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're just going to give whatever <laughs> remaining minutes we have for Brad, but I know for me, today is a life changing day for my garden oh, after my your <laughs> presentation. As she said, even if there's one native California plant you can pick up, you'll make a difference. I know in my garden I've got zero and I've been gardening every single day for the last 20, 30 years. Um, but we needed, you know, put more attention, spend more time, put our money and our water on the right plants and not, you know, and not just on anything that looks good. So um, this was hugely informative. I'm sure it's gonna change all of our landscapes here in the Hollywood Hills and surrounding areas. And thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you very much. Lisa, you may want to um, welcome them to the Theodore Kane Foundation. Come visit so that okay. they can. Okay. Is there anyone who didn't sign in? I, I hope you all come come to the foundation. Visit us. We have. One second, you guys. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I want Lisa to finish, and then um, I need you guys for like ten more minutes. Okay. So if you can just yeah. stay seated. So we have classes out at the foundation in landscaping, in horticulture, in maintenance. Um, we have uh, con container gardening classes, we have butterfly gardening classes, we have everything. And so what I would do is use this summer to educate yourselves so you can plant in the fall. There are three part landscaping in particular, that is a great class because there are only eight projects per class and, and you work with a landscape architect and emerge with a site plan of your garden. So, um, you know, really great classes, and then just come out to the foundation and hang around and read all the signs. Thank you. Okay, right. thank you. And you can, you can buy plants at the foundation. Yes, we're open year round. We're uh, open in the summer only Thursday through Saturday, October through June, uh, Tuesday through Saturday. Yeah. Um, it's very hot in the summer, so come early. Come at 8 30 when, when we open. Yeah, it gets pretty hot. <laughs> right, right. I'm going to take Thank my... You. Right. Okay. I'm going to set up right. Okay. That was Thank awesome. You. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Oh, you're welcome. I'm sorry, I went over. No, 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 it's okay. Brad, you ready? Yeah, I just moved this stuff over. So as Brad sets up, just to let you know, what Brad's going to talk about is um, compost, among other things. As you can see, he's got an amazing backyard. He's going to teach us how to grow vigorous, healthy vegetables and have, you know, these green, luscious trees. Um, and what he's going to be talking about in part in those composting and, and other things. Um, something I'm going to share with you now, and I'm going to continue this with other garden class meetings. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard about like rock dust, using rock dust in your garden. Anybody? Hands up. No, rock dust. So the idea of rock dust is that you basically, it's basically crushed rocks and it's got more minerals and vitamins and whatever else to use on your plants. How about using um, beneficial bacteria, fun, fungus and stuff? Has anybody heard that? Anybody? Yeah, so I talked about beneficial, you, you know, buying organic products that have beneficial um, bacteria, beneficial fungus and stuff in the products. Um, but not even that's required. The one and only thing you actually need, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm, we'll see how Brad continues it, if you're gonna feed your plants is just compost. Composting alone is all you actually need. By composting 
the food out of your kitchen, the banana peels, your eggshells, your whatever leftovers, if you've got a great way to actually contain your product and make sure that the wildlife around it doesn't get into it, um, composting is one way to actually bring all of those minerals. You're probably bringing at least half of your periodic table into your garden by actually bringing compost into your, you know, your garden rather than buying something like miracle Grow, which only has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So you're only giving your things three products that actually leach into the soil quickly, and you gotta repeat it every week. But adding compost is something that breaks down and continuously feeds your plants. Um, so if there's one and only thing you should be doing is think compost and think about how to bring organic materials into your garden. I'll be continuing this next class, but <laughs> I'm gonna have Brad conclude this for us, and I'll put the mic on you here. I, can, can you guys hear me without the mic? The mic yeah. actually puts yeah. you on the camera. Oh, does it? Okay. All right. <laughs> so we'll clip. I'll let you. I'll let there. you do that. Okay. And then you just put this in your pocket somewhere. Okay. All right. So welcome. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'm gonna. We're, I'm gonna give you an abbreviated version of, of what I was going to discuss uh, today, but um, I'll, I'll hit the, the highlights. Um, first of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about what our goal as a family is here on this property. Um, we, years ago, we set out to develop a landscape around our house that we could actually eat from as much as possible. We wanted it to be ornamental. Um, we've included natives around, around the property, but we also at the same time wanted to be able to, over a period of time, year round, be able to graze off our own property. And, uh, and so it's been a point of, it's, it's been an evolution. We've, we started by putting these citrus trees in over here. So now we have lemons. Uh, we have very sweet oranges. Uh, we have tangerines. Um, we, have, uh, we have pomegranates. We have avocados growing as well. Blood oranges. Blood oranges, yeah. Um, so we started with that phase, and now we're moving to the point, you know, we've, we've picked up, uh, like, right over there, there's, there's a plant that many times that people look at, and they see it in, in, the, in, the, in the neighborhood, in the Knolls, Loris nobilis, um, Grecian laurel, or sweet laurel, and it can be used in cooking. Um, we, uh, we have uh, pineapple guavas, which are also used for screening, but you can use the flowers as a garnish on salads. Um, but now we started getting into tropicals. So now we're, we're, uh, we're, we've, got some, we've got mango trees. This, we're in zone 22, so we can actually grow tropicals up here. Uh, if we had a really bad frost, we'd be in trouble. But I think we'll be okay. Um, you know, especially, well, you know, the, everybody disputes the climate change, but if the climate is, if it's getting warmer, then we'll, these, these trees will do better. But we've got loquats, uh, we've got, we're trying sapotes, both the white and the black sapote. Um, we're doing the, uh, this, uh, the southern high bush uh, blueberry, which will actually work here in this, in, uh, in this environment, assuming that they have more of an acid soil. So pretty much if you walk around the property here, uh, we've got a cherimoy on top. Um, We've got, we've got beds up there where we're growing tomatoes, we're growing eggplants, um, we're growing peppers. Uh, all of this, a lot of the lush growth that you've seen, that you see around here uh, that, that's going on, has to do with the compost that, that we've been making in the backyard here. That's how we've been, uh, that's how we've been amending our soil. That's how we've been actually uh, fertilizing or, or providing nutrients in, into the soil as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm a compost fiend. I love, I love talking about compost. I use earthworms in my compost right now, but I know about redworms, and that's uh, that's that, that that is worm casting and worm culture. is It's a different it's a different topic, but I appreciate what you're talking about. But uh, people make fun of me sometimes because when I go to restaurants, I ask for the leftovers, and they don't even look like anything because I bring them I bring them home with me. The waiter looks at me and says, "Why do you want this?" I said, "Well, scrape my wife's meal in there and, and her meal in too." Really? Yeah, because I take it home and I put it right. I hate to see anything go to waste. I just love the idea of bringing the food home and putting it, putting it in the compost pile because I know someday it's coming back here in the garden, it's going to feed all these plants, and it's not going to go into landfills. Now, now, the question, now the question comes down to, you know, why is composting so important, okay? Um, well, we just spoke a little bit about that. It, it goes immediately, if, if you throw your, if you put your, your organics, organics could be like uh, shavings, could be, you know, like celery sticks, uh, could be old fruit that you threw out. No meat, but anything that, that, that comes off the table that's, that's uh, you know, that, that would be considered vegetative. Um, even a paper plate, if you have a paper plate with food and you're throwing it in the trash, you could actually put that paper plate in your compost pile and that will break down too. Newspapers, cardboard, eggshells, coffee grinds, 
Now, um, and I'll talk a little bit about our, our soil here in, in Southern California and with the nature of it. And, and may, then you can kind of understand the reason why compost is important. Here in the hills, we don't, we don't have a whole lot of rainfall. And so as a result, we don't have a lot of biomass that actually comes off of, uh, comes off of the plants like you might in, in, uh, in an eastern uh, forest. Uh, my family, over the years, we've had property back in Pennsylvania. We had 100 acres that, was, you know, that went back generations. And you could walk through that forest, and you could step on it, and you could reach down, and you could smell it. You could smell the, smell the earth, and it was just an incredible, wonderful thing. But they have a lot of rainfall back there. We don't have that rainfall. So therefore, it's, the soil doesn't have nearly, it's not nearly as rich as you would, you would find like an eastern forest. And really, in order for us to, to provide a soil that has that that is full of the microorganisms that we need to for, to break down the nutrients in the soil to feed the plants. We need to do something to it, especially if you want if you want to just leave it the way it looks on the hillside. That's fine, but most people I know really want a, a garden that's alive um, that can support the plants and can support it in a way that it's it's doesn't burn the plants. It's uh, you know the compost is over a period of time. It does have nutrients in it that the plants need, as Charles was talking about, has, has, the trace, has the trace elements too, and it releases it slowly. That's the way that the plants want, the, that's the way that the plants want to be fed. So um, aside from going back to the, the, uh, the, the benefits of, of compost, um, you're not throwing it away, it's not going into an incinerator, which creates toxic waste in, in the air and, the, and of course toxic solids. Um, think about the methane gas that's created with uh, with the, with the anabolic uh, uh, de decomposition of the food. If, it's not, if there's no oxygen, then it releases methane gas in, in, the, in the process, in the landfills. And that's what affects, obviously, that's what affects the, the atmosphere, these greenhouse gases. That's what happens when you put organic material into, into a landfill. When you are putting it into a compost pile and you are properly turning the compost pile, um, you get uh, aerobic uh, bacteria or microorganisms and those don't create those gases and they don't doesn't the compost pile doesn't smell either so that is certainly one plus and also you don't have to we're not using gas transporting uh, uh, petroleum to transport the, the the material with with the with the garbage trucks to the landfill so there's a lot of pluses on, on that aspect the second plus is is that of course that it's good for your garden it makes your garden your, your makes your soil alive like i was saying before puts the nutrients in, puts the carbon, and it puts the, and it puts the nitrogen into the soil that the, that the microorganisms need to be able to break down the nutrients and feed the plants. Uh, it improves the soil structure. Um, we, have, we many times tend to have very clay soil stru structures, and, and, it's, and they're very tight, and they don't drain well. Many plants don't do well with this kind of soil structure, and, um, and they, don't, they don't thrive. If we can open the soil up a little bit, allow a little more oxygen in there, allow the water to pass freely through the, through the, the soils, then it's, then it's a much better condition for the root zone for the plant to actually spread out to, to thrive. And so that's, uh, you know, that's, that's obviously a positive thing. Um, California soils, what are they? They're probably on the alkaline soil, on the alkaline? It depends. I mean, if, if you have, so one third of California native plants evolved in clay soil. Right. And they don't need soil amendments, and, they're, and California soils are nitrogen poor compared to, say, Pennsylvania soils or European soils. But when we say nitrogen poor, we have to remember, oh, they're actually just right for California plants. Exactly. They're not poor in anything. So <laughs> you will need to amend it if you're planting non-natives, but, but for natives, the soil structure is perfect. The microorganisms um, work with the plants, like the mycorrhizae are attracted to the native plant roots because they have a co-evolutionary relationship, and then that helps you save more water. And all that stuff is already there. So, so compost is probably good for edible stuff. Well, for vegetables, um, for, for basic ornamentals that you see growing around here. Um, up here, this is a different zone. I haven't really amended that up there, and I actually tried to put, I put some Quercus agrifolia coastal live oaks up there, but it got too hot and they died out, and it was during a, a period. But up there, they would do fine, and that's not amended. They could do okay with the alkaline soils. But down here, where you have Sarcococca, you have Pittosporum, you have a Butylon, and there's, I guess, that, that would, Mahonia repens would be considered uh, yeah, a, a native. And then the, um, 
um, ribes viburnifolium that's in the back. Right. Is also yep, that's a that's a current, and then we've uh, uh, carpentry, carpentry, carpentry of California. That's also there. So those so those will grow because they're and, and they'll do okay in in this uh, you know with with a little little with the soil being a little bit richer, but you know these are you know for a garden an interior garden that is that is non-native. Um, composting is, is so important. Um, finally, I would say that it's that uh, you know the, the, you feel like you're part of the, 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 the cycle of life, the chain of, of being able to you know where life evolves and then you know naturally because naturally in nature things live, they die, they fall to the ground, they go back into the soil. With composting, you're speeding the process up and you're putting it back into the soil, so you're actually helping that process along and, and you're making your soil richer. It, it, you know, so I'd say. Just to eat, it's a feel good thing as well. Okay. So, how many of you guys compost at this point? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Excellent. There's many different ways you can compost too. Um, I have an example here today, which is this, is this is my baby right here. This is the one that cranks out the most compost for me. Um, and there's, uh, there is many people uh, do it kind of the lazy way where they just kind of heap. Uh, you know, like uh, green matter, brown matter, uh, manure onto it and just let it sit and compost over a period of time. But the problem is, like I, I spoke about earlier about the bacteria, um, the, the, uh, the bacteria does not, the, the beneficial bacteria, the aerobic bacteria that breaks down the compost the right way, doesn't survive well if you don't actually aerate the compost pile. I mean, that's, that's part of it. You want oxygen in there. So it's so we have to you know uh, you know we have to keep those kind of things in mind. So you can you can compost. This is called a bio stack right here, and I'll talk about it a little more later, and I'll show you how it's done. But this particular composter is easy for me to actually mix the compost up as we're going along. So it's it you can basically it stacks up, stacks down, stacks up, stacks down. So I can continue to move the compost back and forth, mixing the ingredients. Putting oxygen back into the in, in, into the uh, entire in, into the entire compost and watering it as I need to. Okay, and, and the, what, we'll talk about the watering in a little bit. But anyway, the first thing you do, the first thing you have to think about is you have to think about a spot in your garden, sunny spot, you know, maybe off to the side someplace where you know it's not compost piles are not always the most attractive thing, but you want it someplace where um, it's going to get a little sun and you have a little bit of space to move around with it. Now, a compost, a compost bin can actually be as long as this, is this particular open space here where people just, if you have a lot of compost that you're doing, or it can be like a six by three spot where you're just, where you move this thing from here to here back and forth. Um, there's many different composters on the market. I like this style of composter. I've, I've tried a couple diff different ones um, because it breaks down quicker and it breaks down a little more thoroughly, okay? Um, I've got here, um, I've got some ingredients here that, that I'm going to pass around just so that you guys can uh, so that you guys can can see what I start with and what I end up with. I'm going to pass this now. I put together basically a presentation, but if anybody's interested, I can email it to them or I can mail it to them as well, and some of the links too if you're interested. So I'm just going to pass this around. If you're interested, put your email address on there, and we can um, and we can talk about that. Um, so so after you have that spot located. Um, you want to you want to make sure it's near a water source, near a near a, uh, a faucet, so that you can water the compost when you need to. Um, so if you can put it near a hose uh, hose bib, that's that's always good too. Sun hose bib, um, you know, six by three at the at the very minimum probably would be what I would recommend. Now go online and research the composters. Um, you know, obviously it's it's so easy these days to find out which the best one is. There's some of them you can turn. You can go back and forth and you can turn them and it mixes the ingredients that way. Um, I actually am building one out of wood that's very similar to this too. It's the 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 ingredient, the uh, all the, the wood, the nails, everything's cost me about sixty-five dollars for it, and it's made. It's it's going to be a redwood uh, compost bin. Um, I'm happy to send send you guys the plans on that as well. And it's the same process about stacking. So um, either you you buy it, they can go anywhere from eighty-five dollars all the way up to four hundred dollars, even beyond that for a good one. Okay. So do your research there. Some people don't even. Bin. They just pile, pile it up. That works too, but as I said, you can't, it doesn't go as quickly. It takes much longer to do that and it, it doesn't... Uh, you like those ones turn? Those, you know what, I've never used one of those. I've heard people uh, have, that they've had good reports with it. Um, many times what people will use is, uh, this is called a compost maker. 
what it is is, is it's, it's something that people, you can buy it, um, you can buy it at Home Depot or Lowe's. You can add it in with the ingredients and with those ones that actually, with, with the circular uh, rotating composters, um, you know, you could, you could probably throw some of this in as well to be able to, to speed the process up. So it's just, you know, there's, there's a couple different products out there. I just, I just use the basic natural products that I have and some bacteria. So, um, so once, you've, once you've decided on the composter you want, either you build it yourself or you buy it in after you've re done some research. Um, you'll want a pair of gloves. Charles always, Charles asked last time when I was, when, when I attended, it was the first time I thought about, about getting gloves. I always work, I always work barehanded because, in, and I end up with a lot of cuts, but just the way I've learned to do it. Um, you'll want a pitchfork if you're, you know, if you're doing it this way instead of turning it. Um, this is very helpful. Um, a shovel possibly as well. And then this little gadget. Well, this is actually, it's a little bit beat up because I haven't used it recently. Um, my wife doesn't like it, but what it is is it's a uh, it's 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 basically a storage unit and it has a top on it that you keep in your kitchen. You can keep it under the sink, and as you get kitchen scraps, you can put it in there and put the top on there. It has a little filter on the top of it, and so you can keep it. It's they have some very decorative ones that are stainless steel. Can match you know if you have appliances that are stainless steel. This happens to be black with a top on it, and you know so so it doesn't look too bad in your kitchen. But the idea is is once this is filled up. You know, with your um, with your orange peels, with your uh, coffee grounds, um, all of those things, you can take it out to the compost and dump it in. Okay, hi Sandy. Uh, you said that uh, you can use paper. <coughs> so if you have coffee in your filters, can you use the whole paper? thing? No, you can put tea, ba tea bags too. Okay. But I would take the I would take the maybe the label off or anything like the metal staple or whatever. But you can use tea bags in there too, so long as they're the the, the biodegradable tea bags. So anyway, but this is this is one this is one thing I would highly recommend also having in the kitchen so that it's not, you know, if you put it in a plastic bag that looks kind of ugly. If you have a container like this, it could look kind of stylish. You you know, it could be the color of your kitchen. You know, you can choose. So anyway, that is that is the basics that 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 you that, you, um, that I would say that you'd need to start with. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the actual um, the actual ingredients. Um, we spoke about oxygen. Oxi oxygen is important because of, of the, uh, the, the microorganisms de depend on that, and that's part of the uh, ba basically part of the turning process. Um, a compost pile, once it's in action, needs to be turned about every 10 to 15 days for, for, for optimum effects. Um, water is needed. You want approximately 40 to 60 percent moisture in the compost pile. 40 to 60 percent. 40 to 60 percent moisture. And you will know when your compost pile gets too wet because what will happen is, is like with, with this guy right here, I put, when I, put, when I, when I put, start putting the layers up into it, I water each layer lightly. But at the, what happens is all the water goes to the bottom and that's where the problem occurs. So when I move it and I turn it and I, and I actually turn the compost over, I'm mixing the ingredients together to feed the, the, to feed the microorganisms. At the same time, I'm putting the water on top so it, it, it doesn't get too soggy in any part of the compost pile. So you have to watch the water because it, the water will kill the beneficial microorganisms. If, if there's too much of it, there, and, and if there's not enough of it, they won't thrive either. So we're, th we're saying 40 to 60 percent, and I'll tell you a little bit on how you, you, you'll know. Um, you know. Obviously, you know what soggy soil is like. If it gets too soggy in there, um, you're not doing it any, any, any favors at that point, so don't overwater it. Um, solar energy, as I said, it needs to be in a sunny place. That's, that's important as well. So now let's talk about the ingredients, okay? Um, a compost pile is actually put together like, kind of like a pizza where you, you kind of stack it. And this is, this is an example of a compost pile, of, 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 the, of how a compost pile is stacked. And it's, um, you're going to have, essentially you're going to have um, the ingredients that you want in, uh, oh yeah, I'm still hooked up. The ingredients that you want to have in the compost pile where you want to layer it, you could, and again, you're going to repeat it. At the very bottom you could put, at the very bottom you could put logs or you could put rocks so that, that there's oxygen coming from, from the bottom. Um, but you want to you want to have uh, green matter, you want to have brown matter, you want to have native soil, and you want to have kitchen scraps in there. 
and you alternate that. As, it, as you start to stack up the compost pile, you want to create these layers because later on you're going to mix these layers up and they're all going to be together. It's, it's kind of like when you're eating your food, you're mixing your beans and your rice. It all becomes kind of one. And um, so let's talk about the difference between green matter and brown, brown matter. Um, this is, I'll pass this around, this is, this is an example of, of brown matter. Brown matter is um, essentially uh, anything out of the garden, um, and, and, it could, and it could include paper and cardboard, eggshells, uh, coffee grinds. Sure, that's okay, that's all right. Um, thank you for coming. And, uh, and leaves that have fallen on the ground, um, it includes, uh, you know, uh, also uh, dead, dead, dead leaves or dead stems that are small. Nothing large. You don't want anything very large because that'll br that, that, that won't break down properly. But that is, this, that is the source of carbon that the microorgani microorganisms need in the compost to, to, to be able to, to get their energy. Um, you also want to have green matter. Now, green matter could be grass clippings. It could be green leaves. Um, this is the source of nitrogen. So... You know, as you're going through, you're doing weeds, you don't want any weeds with weed seeds on there. You just want like, you just want either grass clippings, which not a lot of people, I'm not going to get any grass clippings off of this, but, but like if I have any broadleaf weeds, anything that doesn't have a seed on it, I'll throw that in there. Anything when we're, when we're gardening, I'll put that, you know, I, I've already got my, my brown matter down, I put my green matter. Um, and then, you know, so that's, that, that would represent the green matter. And then, in, and so you've got your carbon, you've got your nitrogen. Then the kitchen scraps, you dump it all on there. Potatoes, tomatoes, uh, pasta, um, bread, you know, anything along those lines, it's not meat. Um, and, uh, and you could put steer manure, but you can't put any pet, like, like you can't put any cat manure or dog manure or anything like that because they do have uh, parasites that, that can affect, later on you could pick up. So you don't want, you know, again, I've, you know, I've, I've got uh, something similar to, to uh, you know, like a, like a, a rabbit. And I take the litter and I put that in there because, you know, of course they're vegetarians and, and, it's, and it's not a problem. So you can put those sort of things in there. Wood products, uh, uh, you can put, uh, I mean, with that, that would be for the brown, but you could put, uh, you know, anything that, that comes out of the kitchen, you can put in there as well. And anything you might bring home from, from, the, from the restaurant. Um, finally, the native soil. The native soil is important for a couple reasons. Number one, it gives the compost structure. But more importantly, it brings the microorganisms in that you need to, to, to start the composting process. It's like putting the, those ladies that, 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 that bake bread, the yeast, right? It's about the yeast. So this is, it's about the, it's about the microorganisms. Okay, so that's, that's it. You've got it going, you stack it, you just repeat it. You know, brown, green, soil, garden, garden scraps, all the way to the top, and you keep it covered. Yes, sir? No. No, because it's again the soil that we have, lime would not be good for, for, for the, the soil we have. I wouldn't use any wood ash either. Any yeah, it's not it's it wouldn't it wouldn't help out with, with, with our existing soils. If you can grind them up, it's not gonna I don't know if they'll, they'll break down very well, but yeah, but eggshells for sure. Yes sir. What about the ash from the barbecue? No. No, I wouldn't use that because again, there could be carcinogens in that. Um, there could be, and it's also, it's, it, it's, it, it, they're more alkaline. You don't want alkalinity. We want more of an acid and we want to bring acidity more to, to, to bring the, the, the alkalinity down in the, in, in the uh, process. So, um, so that is, that's, those are the ingredients. That's how, that's how we, we get, we get it rolling. Um, you know, as far as, as far as being able to turn it over, being able to mix it. Um, so, you know, it's, I've got this compost bin behind me right here. And this is, you know, the, we talked about everything that we need. So we're talking about the layering method. So what I would do typically is, you know, once I'm done with my composting, and here, here's an example of the compost that I've created. This is my latest batch, just to give you an idea. If you, can, you want to open it up, that's fine. It's been thoroughly composted. Um, there's going to be some almond shells in there. You'll probably find a few eggshells. Um, but what I t I've even done is, is uh, some, of the, some of the old plants that were in pots that, that we forgot to water or whatever that died, I'll take that soil mix and I'll throw it in there too. So there's some perlite, uh, vermiculite in there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, but I keep, basically I keep working it until I get it to a point where I can actually put it in the garden. It has the nutrients. It's going gonna, it's gonna to give that soil some life. 
There's probably even some, some, uh, some uh, earthworms in there too. And the earthworms, of course, create the castings. They're good for your garden. That's something that, that's important. Well, again, when, if you take a look at that, that this, is, this is a product that's ready because it's broken down. The size of the particle, the smell of it, it doesn't have a bad smell. It doesn't have an or, uh, too, too much of an organic smell anymore. Um, doesn't have that nasty smell. Oh, earthy. It has an earthy smell, yes. About four months, maybe, and if you're doing it right, okay. yeah, if you're doing it right. But you'll see there's still some remnants, and I, as I'm doing it, I pull out, like if something doesn't compost correctly, if there's a stick in there, I'll pull the stick out, throw it aside, you know, and because I don't want that. Um, when it goes in there, that's, I've been, you know, the, my latest project is over there where I've got the, uh, uh, the persimmons growing against, the, against the, the garage and the apples, and it's really, the soil is quite alive over there, and so, that's going to be our next project. We're going to be putting medicinal herbs into that garden over there. So um, that's, that, is, that's, that is the end product, once everything goes correctly. Do you believe in uh, making compost tea with water and compost? I've, I've never done it, but Charles knows all about it. He'll be talking about it next time. Next time. Yeah. Time. Okay. So I'm the, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the solid compost guy. So, so anyway, what, what I end up doing, so I start with, uh, let's say that I'm starting, you know, I've, I've, I'm done with my compost. This is, and this is the reason why I like the stack, it's stackable, and it probably because I played with Legos when I was a kid too. That, that, that's probably why I'm so attracted to this. But the first thing I do is obviously start with some, maybe some wood, some wood logs at the bottom of it just to, to, so that it's aerated. Um, but then I put, my first, I put my first pile on. And if, it's, if the first pile is going to be green matter, um, the, after that the next pile could be brown matter. But if I ever put kitchen scraps, I don't want to leave those uncovered because I don't want the smell and I don't want the insects drawn in. Or I don't want an animal like a raccoon or a coyote coming. So um, right away when I put the kitchen scraps in, I go ahead and I cover, and, and I cover it up with dirt, with, with not native dirt. So then as, and I put the top on it, the top keeps, again, it keeps the critters out. You don't want critters in this. Um, so I just put it over the top, it keeps the flies out too, to an extent. So then I get a little bit more, let's say I go out and weed a little bit more in the garden and I get the green waste. So I put another stack on. I put the green waste in there and lo and behold my wife calls me and she says, we've got too many kitchen scraps in here, would you please empty them? So I bring the kitchen scraps out, put them on top. Okay, what's next? The brown, right? Or, or the native soil. Put that on. And I keep, I keep adding until I get to the top. And as I'm doing this, I'm putting water on the compost, okay? So I'm, I'm taking the garden hose out, I'm watering it to a point, maybe 20 seconds, something like that, and then I put this on the top, and I wait for about 10, maybe half, a week and a half, two weeks, okay? Okay, it's time, to, it's time to mix it. Take it off, put it to the side, lift this up. At this point in time, it's still, it's still a little bit on the high side. So I take that, I take the pitchfork, I'll go in and I start mixing it and putting it on the other side. And this on top right here is usually dry because the water goes down, goes down to the bottom. Move it again. Again, whatever's on top here, I take it out, put it on top, mix that. And then finally, I put this one on top. And this one is probably really soaked with water because the water has drained down in there. So it's just, and I'm watching the moisture level, they say about 40 to 60%. Um, so I'll do this for a couple weeks. Now what do I expect to happen? I expect this to start baking. It should be about 120, 140 degrees in here. That's when you know you've done it right. When the moisture's, if you've got the moisture level at the right level, if you've got the right amount of carbon versus nitrogen in this. And when I say that, I'm talking about green versus, versus, the, uh, versus the brown matter that we we're talking about. After two, three weeks, it's gonna be cooking. You're gonna see, you can smell it, you can feel it, you can feel the heat coming off of it. And that's the idea. And you want it to basically, you want it to go through a whole process where, the, where you know, that's, that's obviously, that's, that is, the, those are the microorganisms, that's, they're working. When the, when, when, the heat's, when the heat's turning on, it's kind of like, uh, 
Well, it's kind of like I used to brew beer, and, and, and in the process, when you could, see the, you could see the wort bubbling, it was an exciting time because you knew something was happening there, that the yeast was working. Same with this. You know that it's breaking down. Uh, it's going to go on for a few weeks, you know, and then it will finally stop. It'll, it'll start cooling down. And the solids will start breaking down at the same time. And you keep turning it and keep turning it, and you'll notice, and you pull out the big pieces because you know that they won't, they won't break down. You tried it didn't work. Occasionally I'll find a, like a little toy in there, somehow it got in, you know, I'll put it off to the side, but, uh, or a spoon that somehow got into the, in, into the uh, composter. But once you're done, once you've done it and, you've, and you get to that point where I have that bag that, that, that I was passing around with the, with the soil, um, then you've, you've made it. It's, it can be four months, it could be six months, really depends. It depends on how knowledgeable you are, what you're using, how well you're managing the compost pile, and that goes straight into the garden. And it's, and it's some of the best, most nutritious amendment you can put in. You've made it yourself. It's full, it's, it's full of nutrients. It's, it has the, the beneficial microorganisms in it. It has soil structure that helps, that, that, break, that, that creates a structure to the soil so that the roots can work their way through and that the, that the plants can actually thrive. In, in, in the soil, and that's it's. I've seen I've seen it happen. I've got my tomatoes up there are taken off, and I've used my own compost up there. So it's, um, I you know I'm sorry if I'm so excited about this, but this is to me it's like it's like magic. You know, it's it's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. You want to make sure it's fully composted because you want to make sure that it's uh, that it has broken down. That's not that there's not an excessive amount of nitrogen in there. Um, and that is, then I can use it in, I can actually, because it's not a chemical fertilizer, it's not going to burn the plants. You can put it right in there and it won't burn the plants. It's actually, anything that's in there has actually, over a period of time, that's, that's, that is strong, has leached out, or has, has uh, to a point that it's very safe and very beneficial to use in, in the garden. So, yes sir? Brian, quick question. About five years ago, the city of LA had a program to encourage what you just talked about, and they gave away all of those free. Do they still have that. Program? That's that's where I got this one. I went oh, to the, okay. I went over to Griffith Park and I got that's it. Right. Yeah, they, that's, exactly that's a freebie. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. They still have that. They I don't know if they do, but they had they they were holding the classes over at Griffith Park for a while, oh, and okay. it would be good to go to see if you could go to one of those um, Los Angeles City websites and and you know either Google it or you know look it up. Um, that would be good to do because and and they're knowledgeable too. They'll they'll help you out and they give give you things as well. So the one thing I wouldn't do though is I wouldn't take the free compost from the city of Los Angeles, and I'll tell you the reason why. Because because I put. What, you know what, I, I, everything I can compost, I put, I, I put it in, in my bins over here. The things I can't compost, and these are the things that you wouldn't want to put in your compost bin, thorny, um, thorny roses, plants, think about it. I mean, a lot of people have, have sprayed their lawn with chemicals. They, they're, they're taking the cuttings from, from, from lawns. You don't know where that stuff came from. You know, if you don't know where it came from, don't take it, right? And that's, that's kind of why it's, uh, years ago somebody in, asked me if I wanted to go ahead and, and uh, get some of that compost, and I just said, no. It's, uh... Uh-huh. Yeah, that's all right. I mean, it's just, it's, it's you know, I mean, it, basically chemical, we try to avoid chemical fertilizers as much as possible. With grass, it's kind of hard to get around going, you know, there, there are slow-release fertilizers, but the, the quickest way to get a grass green is obviously is, is you know, is, is these Scots or whatever it is. But if you put it in there, it, it's not going to be entirely organic, but it's still going to work, it's still going to work the, the process through. You'll still want the grass clippings. I'd rather you put those grass clippings in the compost bin because the chemicals, as the chemicals break down, they break down to the way that the plant needs it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's toxic. It just means that the plant is getting its source of nitrogen from, you know, a synthetic fertilizer. Not the best for, for long-term soil fertility and viability, but good for keeping your lawn green and not going to really hurt by putting it in your compost bin. It's just the insecticides that you would spray on there. And that's, you know, we were talking earlier about staying away from insecticides. And if you have a well-balanced, like anything else, a well-balanced financial portfolio or a well-balanced garden, things are a lot better, right? So anyway, uh, any other questions? 
those. Like if you, you know, any foods, I do organic mm -hmm. 90%, but there's always you know, some things you have in there. If, if it bothers you, if it bothers you, I wouldn't put it in the compost. I mean, do, do you have any idea how it breaks down or if there's... I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I'm sure, I'm sure I put a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, vegetables that were grown non, you know, that, that were basically, uh, you know, bred, uh, hybridized, they've probably gone in my compost bin. I'm not, it doesn't bother me that much, but if it bothers you, I wouldn't do it. You know, that's, but I, I, I don't notice the difference. I mean, especially if, you know, especially if it's going in an ornamental setting. So. You yes, yeah. you can steer manure, but steer, steer manure is really salty too. You know that, right? So it's it's uh, it, so long as you mix it thoroughly. But yes, by all means, steer manure can be used. One more question. Sure. The mushrooms that come up in the manure, can you eat those? The mushrooms? <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, well, I mean, you can eat certain mushrooms, but be 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 be, be very careful because people have lost their kidneys or livers over eating the wrong kind of uh, mushrooms. I want to um, quickly introduce the people that are here. Got to take a quick photo because I know half of you guys are going to split as soon as you get some food. But I want to um, first thank Brad for hosting and sharing some of his knowledge with us. So here we are in conclusion of the summer 2016 Hollywood Knowles Garden Club meeting. This is our 10th um, Garden Club meeting that, that we've hosted here in the Hollywood Knowles at various residents' homes throughout the Hollywood Hills. And I hope you've now learned that compost is the one and only thing your plants need for health, you know, to become a healthy and, um, and thriving plant and highly productive. Compost alone actually has almost all of the nutrients and all of the minerals that your plants need. So making a good compost is critical to having a beautiful and luscious garden like this and growing vegetables um, as large as these giant tomatoes that I've got here in my hand. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if, and if so, be sure to like it, and most importantly, subscribe down below so you don't miss any of our other videos that usually come out once every three months, and sometimes as frequently as once a month. So please be sure to subscribe, and happy gardening.